ASN thanks Otska America Pharmaceutical Inc. for support of this podcast. Hello and welcome to the ASN Kidney Week 2021 Day 3 podcast. My name is Michelle Josephson. I'm a transplant nephrologist at University of Chicago and the current secretary of ASN. I am thrilled to be joined today by Mukta Boesia and Laura Morsetter, both of whom are involved in the United for Kidney Health campaign. Just as some quick background, the United for Health Kidney campaign had a soft launch at the end of September and officially started during this meeting. The campaign aims to increase awareness of and highlights top priorities in our field to move us from our current focus on end-stage treatments and disease states towards early intervention in kidney health with the audacious ultimate goal of having a world without kidney disease. The four priorities of the campaign are intervene earlier to prevent, diagnose, coordinate care, and educate, the priority that Dr. Marsutter is representing, transform transplant, and increase access to donor kidneys, accelerate innovation and expand patient choice, and four, achieve equity and eliminate disparities, the priority that Dr. Boesia is championing. Lauren Mukta, please introduce yourselves to our audience to tell us a bit about what in your personal and professional experiences led to your interest in being involved in this campaign and the priorities that you speak to. Laura, let's start with you. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be involved and and be invited to this podcast today. Um, It has really been an interesting journey. So I am um, a part of the University of Wisconsin. I've had some really interesting clinical assignments. And through those clinical assignments, have really gotten a chance to see um, kind of the impact of what early interventions can lead to. And through these, it, it, it becomes obvious to me that to be able to make the biggest impact in, in what we're doing, really uniting all four of these priorities is important, but really thinking about how do we move forward with the per- disease prevention. And it's been so cool to see throughout Kidney Week how, how that priority continues to weave itself throughout the um, various lectures, the various um, you know, plenary speakers, really thinking about um, you know, earlier intervention does, does bring together um, you know, the big data kinds of discussions, improving diversity, improving equity, all of those things that really, really um, shine in, in the topics that we're really discussing this week. So, um, Mukta, can you tell us about um, your motivation for involvement and what it means to you to be involved in the campaign? So thank you so much for for having me um, and talking with me about this. I'm really excited to be a part of the campaign, and I'm really excited to talk with you today um, and Laura as well about this. So, you know, my involvement in the campaign, I mean, if if you... if I, if I could be really more just granular about it, it, it kind of even stems for what my motivation was to be a nephrologist to begin with. Um, you know, when I kind of, when I, when I was motivated to become a nephrologist, what I wanted to be was actually kind of like a, you know, a super internist in a way, um, somebody who could take care of a patient as, as a whole um, and just have a little bit of extra understanding of one of their, one of the issues that they um, tend to tend to face. Um but what ends up happening when you know when you're a kidney doctor, you you end up having a lot of frustrations. It's it's not so easy to just say, for example, that a patient with kidney disease doesn't have it anymore. But we have little wins. You know, the blood pressure is controlled, the sugar is controlled, the parameters for my dialysis patients are controlled. So so as a kidney doctor, you end up shifting your expectations. What are the confines of our possibilities can be considered a success? Success. You know, my patient got a transplant, but you know, for a deceased donor in New York, depending on your blood type, the average wait time is maybe seven years. And this is just accepted. And then we start to see different things that we just kind of accepted. And perhaps that wasn't totally, you know, something that we should have done for so many years. And part of what we've accepted is that part of your health is determined by a zip code. You know, we know that diabetes and hypertension, for example, are 70% of the causes of kidney diseases in the United States. And 37 million Americans have kidney diseases. 70% of which are related to the diabetes and hypertension, and 90% of them don't know about it. And does that 90% of them, those who don't know about it, do they just not know because it doesn't affect them or because of various different social determinants of health? And we see this day to day, because what we see is that it ends up being something that's preventable. This is kidney disease or non-communicable disease that we have 
plenty that we could have done to prevent people from suffering and from having their their quality of life compromised by carrying this chronic disease issue. So um, that's part of it, my passion to to address it. Um, I, I you know if we know that there's a lot of preventable um, conditions that are lead to kidney disease and they they affect Black Americans and Americans of Latin or Hispanic background more than their white counterparts, with even up to a three and a half times increased rate in progression to kidney failure. And we know that this stems from social determinants of health. Um, I I just can't. I feel like it would be a total, um, you know, a total disre- disregard for my responsibilities and um, and and morality to not to not be a part of this campaign to not address it. I got to say, I can just so hear the passion in both of your voices, um, which is which is fantastic. And I, I I guess with that, I'm thinking a little bit about if if you draw if you think about um, the priorities and you sort of draw a Venn diagram, um, uh, where do you see your priorities as, as overlapping? Um, Laura, why don't you start first, and then Mukta, I'll ask you to um, to to give us your perspective. Well, I think Kidney Week has done a great job of illustrating that this year. And, you know, we really are pushing towards towards equality and we're really pushing towards highlighting that. And I can say that the last two years have really improved my knowledge, understanding and appreciation for the limitations that many populations have that I, I probably didn't give enough credit to in the past. I hope that's happening for everyone else as well. And I think that just starting there, but then having big dreams, having big expectations, is such an important part. And, you know, just as Mukta was talking about, um, you know, that ability to even diagnose, we, we haven't had that be a priority. And really, that's where we overlap. How do we even acknowledge? How do we start to educate? How do we start to to bring ourselves into the lives of people who where we can really make a difference? And by doing that earlier, I think then we can prevent our need for for nephrologists in their lives in the future. And there's nothing better than that. So bad for job security, but I think I think I think that's where our goals are, and and you know it's 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 kind of comical to say that because in your business mind that's not what we should be doing, but but in the health of our patients I think that that is such a, a neat position to be in. If we can prevent ourselves from having more more patients, we really shift what a nephrologist is. We shift away from being the person who you see when you get sick to a person that can intervene in, in, in diagnosis and prevention. And this week has really brought that to me, too, to just think about, um, you know, the differences between nephrologists and internists and all those preventative visits that we that we did when we were interns and residents. And, you know, that was kind of boring or on the peds rotation where you didn't want to see the healthy kids. And I was like, oh, I just want to see someone with something. Right. But then you you evolve into this. Now, I, I feel like that's a, a joy to be able to get that opportunity when I have a person who comes in with a creatinine of one point three. I'm like, yes, this is great. What can we do? And 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 sometimes I think that, you know, we need to look to that a little more. Mukta, where, where do you see these? That, that's really interesting. And, and Mukta, I wonder where you also see these um, overlap, the overlap of the Venn diagrams or the, the circles, whatever you want to think of them as our prior, the overlap of, the, of our priorities. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think that the my priority again, which is um, achieving equity and eliminating disparities, um, it is a separate priority, but I, I actually really don't think it, it it totally is a separate priority because you can't really achieve the full realization of the other three priorities without achieving equity and care. It's just, it's just very deeply intertwined with those priorities as, as Laura just mentioned, you know, um, so, so just for example, right, when we're talking about intervening earlier, even with advancements in management, our retention and diabetes, we know the disparities between black and uh, Latin, Latin background Americans, um, and as compared to white Americans, and when we're talking about advancements in transplant, we know that, and you, you, Dr. Josephson, are even more of an expert than I am about that. The disparities and all the layers um, of challenges on the, at every step of the way towards getting transplant, um, and when we're talking about accelerating innovation and expanding patient choice, you know, there's been talks in Kidney Week about um, some new medications that we're coming out with, some new therapies, which thankfully we have them. So so, but just for the example of SGLT2 inhibitors, what are the costs of SGLT2 inhibitors and who's going to be able to receive those? Um, you know, so I, I really think that um, um, 
we're not going to be able to actually really fully achieve those other priorities unless we really prioritize um, achieving equity. So um, there's just, you know, it's it's a moral imperative. But, you know, even in the context of the United Four Kidney Health campaign, there's just those few priorities laid out, they, they cannot be achieved um, effectively without achieving equity as well. No, those are excellent points. Um, let me also ask both of you why you think this is the right time for this campaign. Ooh, can I start? I am <laughs> so excited Absolutely. about this. So I, I was looking up, you know, I don't, I don't know a lot about the research in marketing. And, and I was looking this up, just trying to figure out why it is that, that kidney disease was kind of lacking um, in the the day-to-day speak that, that people outside of medicine have. I mean, why is that happening? And there was a JAMA article that came out in January of 2019, and it, it talked about how much of an increase in the direct-to-consumer um, advertising had been going on and, what, and, and how that had changed over time in medicine in particular. And it was really talking about a doubling of the amount that was spent in the in the time between 97 and 2016. And disease awareness itself went from 177 million to 430 million. And so to me, that was really shocking, um, it, but not surprising when you think about what you're seeing on TV. But when do you ever see anything other than this drug might affect your kidneys? Ask your, right. ask your doctor about this drug and how it affects your kidneys. I mean, that's all we get. And so I think time is now for that reason in the fact that we need to integrate ourselves into what the normal people who are hearing um, about heart disease, who are hearing about colonoscopy screening, people who are hearing about those health maintenance kinds of issues to ask about their kidneys. I think people who have been told about it, they do a good job. I get all these calls about, can I start this drug? Can I do this? Will this hurt my kidneys? But only after they've seen me. (laughs) And so wouldn't it be great if people started to do that earlier? Yeah, no, that's so true. Mukta, what are your thoughts about the timing of the campaign? I, I, really, it could be why not three decades ago or four decades ago. And um, I, I, had, <laughs> I had actually talked to one of the former presidents of, of ASN um, about uh, just just her personal choices and careers. And she had said that, you know, when she was in training, she she had been considering rheumatology, but she thought to herself, you know, uh, rheumatology does not really have that many therapeutics. I'm going to go to nephrology. And then, and then we had, uh, you know, turns out rheumatology has all sorts of therapeutics now and, and we're still using the same multiple decades long, uh, therapies. So I think we're behind, um, you know, and I, and I bring up the topic a lot that it's in the year 2021 and we have, we have watches that can do really crazy things like checking an EKG and playing music and detecting your oxygen level and then sending a text message and making a phone call all at the same time. And, you know, I just, I just refuse to believe that we can't get to at least a similar paced advancement within our own, uh, within our own sphere. And of course, it's just inexcusable that we have such wide disparities within our, um, our healthcare community, not just within kidney diseases, but, you know, uh, global throughout healthcare in general. Yeah, no, that absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, and actually, that sort of brings to mind um, somewhat the um, the plenary session this morning uh, when uh, Daniel Kraft uh, described um, some of the um, really unbelievable emerging technology innovations. And I, I, I sort of wondered what your thoughts are about technology innovations as means and tools to achieve your priorities and, and also where the barriers lie um, for, uh, for this. Um, Mukta, why don't, well, since you were sort of talking a little bit about this, why don't I ask you uh, to, to, uh, to go on a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, of course, coming from the lens of who's going to benefit um, first from advancements in technologies. And we have to be sure that as we're going on and developing new new therapies and and tools that we don't create new disparities in the process. I I think it's totally exciting. You know, as I mentioned, like there is so many new things that I I feel like if I were to mention some of the things that I I imagine could be possible, it would actually be a failure of my imagination that I just don't know what will be like in five years. And I don't even know if we'll practice medicine the same way in five years, the way things are going. Um, I mean, you can, you can see a doctor from your phone now. Um, In fact, that's what we were doing in the pandemic. Um, um, but I, 
I, what I, what I want to be ensure happens with these new therapies and new technologies and innovations is that we're able to not just within the United States apply them equitably, but also throughout the world. One of the things I, I, I think about a lot, um, and I, I trying to think about in the, in the terms of how do we prevent a pitfall is uh, how climate change is affecting um, our patient population and what technology and innovation can do um, to address not just climate change as a whole, but the impact on healthcare and the impact on kidney disease. And I'm already seeing that you know, who who gets impacted the most by a lack of technology is, of course, those who have our, our low so lower socioeconomic status who live in certain geographic areas. So, for example, there was a snowstorm in Texas, which was atypical for, for those that don't know or atypical for that region to have such a severe snowstorm. And I think there was also heavy rains um, that ended up just isolating and, and devastating people who suffer from chronic kidney disease, not just kidney, um, and also other conditions, like, for example, if you need to go for chemotherapy appointments or things like that. But our dialysis patients depend on being able to be transported to either our dialysis unit or if they're getting dialysis at home, receive sufficient supplies. And of course, all all modalities need a certain degree of electricity and um, functional water. And, fun you know, um, so these these things are something that we need to keep in mind um, when we're when we're uh, considering our advancements in innovation technology and being able to depend less on just one source of technology, but but be able to have multiple fail safe mechanisms in place, um, not just through in the United States, but throughout the world. No, absolutely. And also think about how how many different areas the technology may reach and may actually in unanticipated ways affect our patients. Um, Laura, what, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I, I think that when you think of technology, we can think of it as an individual care situation, or we can think of it as group care. And, and I really thought he illustrated that this morning quite well. You know, we, we can think of individual care where you're prescribing someone a device. We talk, He talked a little bit about, you know, Point of care monitoring of um, of outpatient potassium levels. That's craziness, um, but that could be something that's that's on the forefront. Um, but then also about group care. So I think the group care idea is one that really can help us with the disparities um, because everyone in a system then gets looked at. And I went to um, one of the other sessions uh, about you know managing CKD in a big healthcare system, and I can't remember the title, but it was uh, earlier this morning. Um, just talking about um, you know. Why, why shouldn't we be at a point where we get a signal that says, here's the four patients that you haven't had a protein to creatinine ratio on? Um, should we get that done? You know, and those kinds of things like would be really great. Here's your hypertension diabe diabetic patient in an underserved area who has not gotten these labs done. Can we bring them in? Um, and those types of, of management techniques might be better at, at decreasing the, the issues that, that we currently are experiencing. But I can't imagine um, being a person to prescribe someone an eye watch. And, you know, that that is a, an, an interesting idea that he talked about. But it does it does make a lot of sense. You know, he had talked about, well, gosh, if someone leaves the hospital um, and then they're not walking around as much as they were before, can we can we signal to them that maybe they're not feeling as well and they need to come in or be seen because that could prevent something further from happening? And that's just an example of something minimal. But, gosh, we could do that in lots of different ways to be able to to, to highlight health. Um, and, and, you know, I could reuse a reminder on my iWatch other than Apple to be able to say, hey, you haven't been exercising enough. They, if they called me, I would totally do it more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think you, that really speaks to how to how to diagnose or tools that could help us diagnose earlier. Yeah, absolutely. But let's face it, you know, all of these goals are important as well as really difficult to achieve. Um, and um, this campaign, I have to say, it's inspirational, aspirational, and I cannot tell you how your involvement has has really made it made it so. It's it's been just uh, fantastic to see you you doing this. And um, I'm wondering though, um, what more than awareness can we strive for? I'm really asking you, um, how can we put these words and goals into action, and how can we each make a difference? Um, Mukta, why don't I why don't I ask you next? What your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, there's there's definitely different ways we can make a difference, and it depends on who you are. If you're 
we're all members of the kidney community, but if you're a patient or a provider or, um, or, or, or another kind of healthcare professional, um, awareness, yes, it, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily going to be enough. Um, we have to be able to do the work to um, address things from a greater policy perspective, from a internal perspective, depending on what kind of institution we belong to. So, um, you know, for example, if you're in part of an academic institution, what work do you need to do within your own institution to make the roles for your, the community that you serve? And um, another action that I think is important in terms of community is really engaging and immersing yourself in them. Before anybody gets a kidney disease problem, for example, or even outside of a healthcare context, knowing the community that you serve is crucial to being able to um, deliver healthcare as a whole. We're not just talking about kidney disease, because I, I, as I alluded to earlier, you know, one of the reasons why I became a nephrologist is because I wanted to be a better internist. And part of being a good internist is being a good a good citizen of the community and not just a, not just the local community, but a global, a global citizen. And um, so there, there's local actions that you can take. There's larger policy, broader policy. As I mentioned before, I, I do believe that we, 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 um, we tend to operate in our society based on financial benefit. And I think we need to find ways in a policy perspective to make it a financial disincentive um, to do the wrong thing for the patient. Um, and a lot of how we operate is unfortunately, while it's standard of care medicine, um, oftentimes um, not the best for the patient, but it is the only thing that we can do within the confine, confines of our, possi um, of our, of our potential possibilities. Um, the other thing that we need to do is we need to anticipate upcoming issues um, and prepare. What what's the next pandemic going to look like? Unfortunately, we've had pandemics every couple of decades now. Although this one is perhaps the most um, societally burdensome, uh, COVID nineteen. Um, for those who aren't listening to this in the year twenty twenty one, but but um, you know, what is the next pandemic going to look like? How is it going to impact our patients? Um, how can we prepare for that? You know, we've already adjusted. We're keeping social distance in the waiting rooms for our dialysis units. How do we how do we incorporate technology to be able to ensure that Patients don't are not at increased risk as a result of a pandemic as they are right now. Um, remarkably more at, um, at increased risk. So, for example, what Laura was saying, can we check point of care potassium remotely uh, at that point? How do we integrate that and make it so that it's possible seamlessly? Um, and uh, so, those are those are some of the issues that we can do. And just to list a few things, and I, and for those who didn't get a chance to listen to the um, or to watch the the session on Thursday, um, you know, I have some specific policy interests in mind, which is. We need to expand insurance coverage, including Medicare expansion. We need to educate um, not just patients, but also primary care doctors and others about what are the CKD, chronic kidney disease risk factors, and, and what are treatment options uh, that primary care doctors can do. We need to be able to find ways, um, either locally or broad spectrum, how to reduce fragmentation in care. We need to provide home dialysis assistance so more more patients can be candidates for home dialysis if that's where if that's where they are they are at in their care. We need to be able to expand social workers, and we need better transplantation oversight and. Um, you know, we also, from a research standpoint, we need to be sure we make a increasing diversity in, in clinical trials uh, a priority so that we're able to make efficient um, or more appropriate recommendations for our, our um, diverse patient population. So, um, Laura, uh, with intervening earlier, how do you think we can start to do that? Is this something that nephrology can do by itself? Um, do we need to enlist others, such as our primary care physicians? Uh, tell me what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So when I when I first heard about United for Kidney Health, I said, oh, this sounds amazing. So what are the action items? And they were like, um, we're not sure exactly what that is yet. And I was like, what? We can't do this without having action items. And so I've, I've actually struggled with that a little bit because we, like you said, we have to start somewhere and at least getting our heads in alignment towards the priorities or goals that we want to achieve is a great start. And, and then starting to enlist people who are already doing the actions that are going to be impactful, I think is also really important. I feel like we're somewhat fragmented at times 
where we see actions happening in all these different places and we think, oh, that's so great. But when do we think, well, let me take that back and actually do it. Let me bring that to my institution. There was a great talk about an EPIC intervention that was being done. Well, everyone who has EPIC could do that same thing. And so how do we make those things available so that, that those tools and the work that's already being done is actually coming to fruition in more places than just that place where the, where the PI or, or leader um, was making that happen? Um, but I think if this campaign is going to be successful, you know, we're really working at trying to make awareness happen, but we have to be able to give people some action items. Mm -hmm. And so I think the leaders of this campaign are really going to have to come up with the grassroots efforts, what specifically can we do in our locations, and then the more policy or big ticket items where maybe ASN as a whole can, can lead that, you know, that legislative change, those legislative actions. And then I think we also need to bring together just creative leaders, people who are creatively doing things to brainstorm together about how do we do this efficiently? How do we you know, get those lists of things that are, are being published or being um, done in other places and then, and then make that happen? Um, and my priority in particular, the NKF has been, you know, the, the group that's really done a lot of action. They have this, um, this campaign called Voices for Kidney Health. And, um, and the president of the NKF has, has gone and spoken at the American Academy of Family Practice this year, talking about how important it is to diagnose and, and, and be prevention and prevent um, kidney diseases. And so joining with them, there's no reason we have to compete. Let's join together and make this happen so that that, you know, we really can can do that. So I think overall, just invo involving our whole community with items that they really can do, but then being really creative about how we tackle this and, and understanding that we shouldn't do it the same because the same hasn't worked. Yeah, no, I think you bring up some good points and we really have to break down silos. We really have to collaborate. We really have to remember that um, you know, we're, we're all here doing this for the patients and, and we have to do it best, which really brings me up to the, a, a question I had, which is um, how, how do you each think the campaign will help patients? Um, Mukta, what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, you know, that's, that's actually a really great question and so important because at the end of the day, aren't, isn't that what, who we're here for? Um, I think that the campaign will help patients in one, because they can see that the entire community understands that their their health and their care has not necessarily been facing new therapies new treatments new um new really anything um and um and i think that what they can see is that there's a motivation to help them that we're advocating for patients that patients are advocating for patients um and that we're all working together to come up with more creative solutions that benefit ultimately them because that's what we're here for um we're we're not here for ourselves. Um, and, and that's kind of why I liked, I liked a lot about the campaign too. It's not centering on any one individual. It's broadly approaching priorities that each patient, I think, who's, who's experiencing kidney disease can, can see that they, they, they've had these thoughts before. I wish I had better access to transplant. I wish I knew this earlier. I wish I, I you know, there was something better than, than, than prednisone for me. And, you know, or, and then, and then, the priority which where I'm uh, I'm facing, I've had so many patients who have wondered, could 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 my care have changed, had I not had the circumstances that I have, had I been of a different race, um, so I I believe that that patients will will um, will be able to feel more motivated and more understanding that we're we're with them. Um, so I'm really excited to see to see how to and to hear from them about how how they actually do respond to this campaign and hopefully join it. Yeah, no, that's that's great, Laura. What are you, what are your thoughts about that? So I, I think that in my priority, it's a little bit of a, a of a different way to measure things, and and that becomes hard when the the null set is really what we're looking for, right? And so it's it's a little harder to to track how many people didn't go on dialysis or how many people didn't have chronic kidney disease that that maybe should have. I guess we can look at risk factors, um, but you know the the effect in patients is is really being able to empower them to have knowledge um, to make it difference in what happens in their lives. And, um, 
And we, you know, as a healthcare team, we haven't done a great job of that in my mind. We haven't done a great job of treating health and, and we really need to change our focus into prevention instead of just treating, treating diseases. And um, of course, you know, especially in kidney disease, there is that subset where, you know, who knows how come that happened and how that happened. And, and that is such a much more rare occurrence than the everyday hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease that we see over and over. And if we could just change our focus and that smaller subset of the people that we're really taking care of and really the rest were preventing disease, that's a different way to look at, at, at our specialty. And I think something that could then change how patients view their health. Um, so Mukt and Laura, our, our time unfortunately is up and I, I, I cannot thank you enough for, um, for taking time today to talk to me about your thoughts um, and, your, and describe your involvement in the United for Kidney Health campaign. It's, um, it's just fantastic to uh, talk to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. ASN Thanks, Otska America Pharmaceutical Inc for support of this podcast.